Hi everyone, I'm Allie Katz. I'm the program coordinator at Kelly Writers House and I'm super excited for tonight. Uh, we have Anthony De Curtis, our professor in charge of real arts, uh, interviewing David Brown. It's gonna be an amazing conversation. We're always just so grateful to have Anthony putting us in touch with people doing the work in the arts and talking to journalists and musicians and writers. Uh, about how things are made. So thank you so much, Anthony, uh, for bringing David. And David, thank Hi, you so everyone. much for coming. I'm Allie Katz. I'm the program um, coordinator at and the Writers House. And without further ado, Anthony and uh, We have Anthony De Curtis, our professor We're in charge of real arts, uh, interviewing David Brown. It's going to be an amazing conversation. We're always just so grateful to have Anthony putting us in touch with people doing the work in the arts and talking to journalists and writers uh, about how things are made. So thank you so much. I don't Anthony, think I have anything uh, going. For bringing David and David, thank you so much for coming. I'm Allie Katz, I'm the program. Um, and yeah. us, uh, without further ado, Anthony and- looping, like It's like a Brian Eno interview. We're like looping Allie's interview. talking to journalists and writers uh, about how things are made. So much I don't think I have anything uh, going. I just shut everything down online. Okay. Uh, and without uh, yeah. further ado, and like it's like a Brian Eno interview. Okay. Uh, kind of a sonic youthish feedback to loop in there, Anthony. Journalists, writers, things are made. Is everybody hearing this or are we? Um... Okay. All right. Um, apologize for our technical difficulties, uh, which hopefully we've sorted out. Uh, I am just uh, couldn't possibly be happier to, than to have uh, uh, David Brown with us today. Uh, I only wish it was in person. Uh, David is uh, 
you know, a mainstay at Rolling Stone these days, doing great work there. Uh, and previously had been uh, the pop music critic at Entertainment Weekly and at the uh, New York Daily News. Started a magazine where I, I'm proud to say he hired me to do some work from time to time called Music and Sound Output. And um, David has written a number of books, uh, one on uh, Jeff Buckley and his father, Tim Buckley, uh, one on The Grateful Dead, uh, one most recently on um, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And one thing that uh, I, you know, always appreciated about David and, uh, and, and, and still appreciate in his writing is um, he never sort of, sort of, David writes about very popular things, but not in, ever in an obvious way. I mean, uh, his take is always very distinct without being, you know, I'm being, uh, you know, contrarian or weird. It's just, he has a very fresh set of eyes. He writes about things, uh, you know, really as he sees them. And, uh, you know, just for example, I mean, everybody was writing about, you know, Jeff Buckley and noting in two sentences that uh, his father was this great um, 60s songwriter named uh, Tim Buckley. But, you know, David went in and really just, you know, explored all the connections between these two figures. And it is, you know, really a wonderful book. And, uh, you know, most recently, you know, his book about Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, which is a big bite. I mean, uh, just is so fresh on every page. I mean, it's, um, it's very well written as always, but uh, the level of thinking and, uh, you know, the level of uh, kind of musical understanding and cultural understanding is uh, extremely impressive. So David, it's really a delight to have you. Uh, I hope that, you know, sometime you'll come down actually physically to Penn. Yeah, I'd love to. And, and uh, thanks for having me, Anthony, uh, uh, and for, for those incredibly uh, kind words you just said. I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, you and I have known each other for a long time now, and it's always uh, always great to to talk to you about this stuff. And, and uh, you know, um, I remember picking picking your brain many times at the beginning of my career about how to do this thing when I wrote for you at Record Magazine way back. And uh, so it's... Uh, it's it's always been an honor to uh, to know you and kind of work with you on and off and uh, as on this journey that we've both been on for a long time now. Exactly, exactly. Um, well, let's you know, let's since it is the most recent thing, let's talk about the um, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young book. You know that you know was a big bite. Uh, and why don't you talk about you know what made you decide to take it? Uh, sure. You know. Um, Essentially, that you know, that's a group that I've been following since I was uh, 13. <laughs> I first started buying their records. They were already disbanded by then, and they were this sort of mythical group. And I've been sort of following that saga now for, you know, for decades. Uh, you know, they, they say that, um, uh, I don't know if this applies to you, Anthony, as well, that they're saying that the music that hits you when you're a, a teenager is the stuff that really stays with you the most, oh, the most yeah. meaningful thing. I don't think that's a, a new thought on my part, but I think that certainly applies to these guys. And, you know, I've been sort of following, you know, the, the whole saga for decades, the the reunions, the breakups, the, the reunions again, and, and the way that they reflected uh, so much about the culture as the decades went on. You think of them as like a 60s band, but, but you know, uh, the way that they... Um, had their ups and downs as, as a group and as people and you know, always always reflected what was happening around them, including the, the last time they toured together, which might be the last time at this point was 2006 to to protest the Iraq war. You know, so they were always kind of in a way in their kind of shambolic way kind of plugged into what was happening at the time. Uh, I think they did make a lot of great records after those first two Deja Vu and Crosby, Stills and Nash that we all know. And, you know, no one had, had attempted a book on them in a really, really long time. And uh, we were coming up to the 50th anniversary of their first record. And it just felt like a good time to um, tell that whole story, you know, uh, which, which, which was basically a, at that point a 50 year saga of 
of this, um, you know, this incredibly dysfunctional <laughs> musical family that had, unlike any in, in rock history, and, you know, you and I, Anthony, you and I have interviewed and chronicled many uh, artists over the years. And, and for me, you know, their saga is so unique. It's these four men who have been doing this kind of dance together, personally and musically, for five decades. You know, uh, you know, uh, you know, the Stones and other groups have been around that long too, but but the you know there's nothing quite like the the, the CSNY saga, and I think um, you know I thought about it some more, and I thought you know it's it's fascinating how how each of those guys starting in the '60s and even maybe today uh, spoke to a different aspect, uh, spoke to, to their fans in different ways. You know, you, maybe you looked at David Crosby back then as like the rebel, and you know uh, Neil Young was the kind of uh, loner who only did things his way. I think there were aspects of their personalities that that spoke to people in different ways. So it just seemed like there was a lot to kind of dive into with that that hadn't been done in, in a while. What were, if you have to say, I mean, I know this is always a tough question, but, you know, if you have to say, what, what, what were the, some of the surprises in terms of, uh, you know, your deep dig on the group? You know, what, what didn't you expect and uh, you found? Uh, well, there were all kinds of things, you know, from, uh, stories about you know <laughs> you know the, the crazy fan who tried to break into graham nash's house in the mid-70s who called herself guinevere <laughs> things like that there were all kinds of uh you know uh, uh things like that but i i think uh, and also like the number of times that neil young would put out an album the same week as crosby stills and nash even though there were several that kept uh popping up over and over again um but i, I yeah I, I think there were um it was, it, I think it was kind of surprising to find out, to, to kind of trace the, 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 the roots behind the, the moments that they would come together again. And like, you'd think, you'd, you know, they, they would hit a certain level of success. They, they'd reunite, you know, they'd do a record or tour together and then things would sort of, they'd go off on their own and then things would sort of not work out so well separately. <laughs> and then and the, you saw the, the pattern. And, and the other thing, interesting thing was, um, why uh, Neil would periodically join in with them. And, and that uh, finding the reasons for that, you kind of realize that, um, you know, he really would only hook up with those guys again when it was kind of in his, um, in his best interests. I mean, I think there was a musical interest. I think he genuinely had fondness for those guys. And I think he, would, he knew what they could bring to his music at best, that they could bring a, a harmony blend behind him that he didn't get anywhere else. But you know, I would ask, I was asking uh, one of his one of his friends over the years. Okay, well, why why in 1974 did he suddenly decide? Okay, I want to do another tour with those guys and do stadiums. Like, and he goes, Oh yeah, I, I knew Neil then, and and he had, he needed um, to renovate his ranch. So and he, he still had in his mind, this guy helped him. He's like, yeah, so we needed 20,000 or whatever to pay for the roads. We needed this or that. <laughs> and, you know, things like that would come up and I go, oh, it's not always musical reasons <laughs> why these things happen. So, you know, uh, so every time Neil reunites with Crosby, Nash, there was always some reason like that, that I, that I didn't quite know going into it beyond just like, oh, let's just give this one more chance. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, let's, you know, sort of look back a little bit, you know, in, in terms of, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, getting interested in, uh, in Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, you know, when you were 13, you know, what were some of the, uh, you know, early experiences that maybe led you on the road to, you know, wanting to write about music? Uh, you know, I grew up reading, um, Rolling Stone and and Crawdaddy and Cream and all those magazines when I was a kid, and uh, as as, as uh, you know, re reading reading the work of someone like Cameron Crowe, who was probably just a few years older than me, and was like writing, you know, interviewing Neil Young on the cover of Rolling Stone, and it was sort of mind blowing to me. And and I you know I, I always loved uh, I always loved to write as a kid. My mom. Uh, was a big fan of biographies and she had around the house Frank Sinatra and Montgomery Cliff books that I would sort of dip into. And uh, I loved music starting as a kid. So it just seemed like some natural thing that maybe I could do at some point in my life. Uh, I was completely naive about it. And 
uh, I went to NYU, uh, majored in journalism and uh, minored in music. Even then I thought, well, gee, maybe I can be a music writer. And if so, I should, I should know a little bit about the technical aspects of music. So I did minor in it. There were no rock classes back then. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, Anthony. Sure. It was, I, the closest you got was like a folk music class. It was all sort of classical music stuff. There was no Beyonce classes like there are now, <laughs> you know, unfortunately. No Clive Davis school. <laughs> but, but I remember there was actually a very important mo moment uh, in my last year at college at NYU. Um, we were, I took a course on magazine writing and our, and our assignment was uh, to spend most of the semester uh, researching and reporting and then writing like a big story. And you had to pitch the idea to your professor. Uh, it was Helen Epstein. I don't know where Helen is now, but she, she was a great professor on that. And I, um, NYU was in the village, in Greenwich Village. And so at the time there was this burbling uh, revival uh, and maybe, you know, Anthony, you, you grew up near there uh, yeah. in the early 80s of, of, of a new folk scene reviving. Yeah. And you had people like Suzanne Vega and Suzanne Vega and Sean Colvin and uh, all, all kinds of people, uh, you know, applying their craft at a very uncool time to be doing that at all these village folk clubs. And so I pitched that idea. My professor was like, oh, that's really interesting. I didn't even know that was happening. And, you know, I spent a few weeks just you know, hanging out in Folk City and the club called the Speakeasy and the Bitter End and all those places and interviewing these people and, um, and doing a, an article about it for the class. And uh, it was such a, um, an incredible experience for me to do something like that. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, it, you know, it's really rewarding and, and, and uh, had uh, taught me so much about the scene and everything. And, and I think that was, you know, I came out of that thinking, wow, like that was, that was really fun to do. It was a lot of work, but it was really fun. And maybe I can keep doing that. Um, I, let me interject here. I should say that, uh, you know, David and I will be talking for a while and then, um, you know, we'll take some questions. If anybody has any, you know, you can put them in chat mode or I think somebody is gathering up questions and we'll, we'll pass them along to us. So um, please uh, put your thinking caps on. And uh, <laughs> if, if you have any questions for, uh, uh, you know, for David or for me, for that matter, uh, please let us know. Well, you know, that, um, that, you know, folk revival idea that you just mentioned reminds me of, you know, what I was just talking about, you know, that, you know, you've always seemed to have an eye without, you know, without always kind of hunting, you know, what's the, new, the next new thing or what's going on. You had a, um, and continue to have an ability to, you know, identify into interesting subjects that aren't necessarily on anybody's radar yet. <laughs> and um, yeah, you continue to do that in you know long pieces in Rolling Stone. Uh, you know, I think we've arrived at a time, interestingly, uh, you know, for someone like you, where you know there's so many outlets around that someone who could bring that sort of perspective and do a deep dive into something that people want to know about, even if they don't know about it yet. Uh, I mean, that's a nice spot to be in. Can you talk about that aspect of, you know, what, um, you know, you know, what enables you to sort of identify, uh, you know, what might be an interesting story, even though it's, you know, it's not the record that came out last week and it's not the big release that's coming out next week, but it's, you know, something that is, you know, just a little bit uh, outside the lines, but that is worth knowing about. Um, well, again, thank you, Anthony, for all those uh, really kind words. Um, yeah, it is, you know, I, I guess I, I have tended sometimes to go toward these sort of untold stories and where there's so many decades of pop music history now. And, and uh, it, it is, something I, I consciously or not try to kind of keep an eye out for. Um, uh, you know, maybe a good example would be, um, you know, last year um, was the 50th anniversary of, of Woodstock. And we got this, we have a tips line at Rolling Stone. Uh, and we, somebody emailed us and said, uh, hey, you know, I'm, uh, I'm selling the tapes of the guy who produced the Woodstock album of his original tapes. And we were like, 
what you know a lot of these tips don't really add up to anything but i thought and they had the name of this person i thought really like what is that about so i did some research and sure enough the name he mentioned was a guy named eric blackstead and if you look carefully uh, at the credits of that original Woodstock triple album that yes. some of us had, at the very bottom you see produced by Eric Blackstead, and I was like, "Okay, who is that?" And, and so I, you know, reached out to that person, and it was a whole story I didn't know anything about, which is basically he, Eric Blackstead, who who died a few years ago, um, put together one of the, the the biggest records in in rock history and then to, and just vanished and i was like well, okay what happened to that guy and it turned out to be a, a track down people who knew him and it was a very sad kind of tragic story unfortunately of someone who um put together that record and and did things that we don't even know i mean like there's song there are songs on woodstock that that, that weren't recorded at woodstock you know it's like Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Now that we, now that you mentioned it, those songs were from the Fillmore East, but but you know they, the sound quality or whatever, the Arlo Guthrie coming into Los Angeles was not from Woodstock. That was from the Troubadour in L.A. because his Arlo's mic gave out at Woodstock. So this is the guy who decided what to put in. It is the you know the the um, some of the sound effects, the crickets at the beginning. That's not from Woodstock. That was from a sound effects record. Yeah, and this is the guy who did all that and made a, an actual listenable record out of Woodstock. And then basically his life kind of just deteriorated after that. And he couldn't, you know, there were only kind of career choices that went awry. And, and you know, he ended up, you know, basically almost homeless and, and uh, penniless in Montclair, New Jersey, not far from here where I am right now and where I grew up actually. And, uh, and so that, you know, uh, I tracked down all these people who said who knew him and who were with him right up to the end. And, and, and it, it was a, for me, a fascinating story to work on that, that was playing off of something that was in the media at the time, which is the 50th yeah. anniversary of Woodstock, but, you know, trying to come at it from, a, from a different angle and give people a, 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 a different perspective on that kind of thing. And I, I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm able to, uh, to be able to tell stories like that. And, and uh, there's definitely some of our readers who, you know, really like those kind of things. And, um, and yeah, I'm just kind of naturally drawn to that. Uh, I, I'd have to ask a shrink why, <laughs> why, what makes me want to champion underdogs or something. But uh, I, I, I do tend to love, love those kind of stories. Um, and uh you know, there, there are a lot of them. There are a lot of great untold stories in pop music. Uh, at, uh, and I, I learn that all the time <laughs> as I do my job, you know. You know, it's, um, you know, people talk all the time in, you know, journalism classes and whatnot about story sense, you know, and kind of having, you know, a kind of editorial uh, instinct. But I mean, I think that's finally what you're talking about here. You know, I mean, it's, you know, Somebody else might have heard that name uh, and, oh, the original Woodstock tapes. Well, what's that? I mean, we have the album. Like, why do we need the original tapes? Like, <laughs> uh, you know, and but when you start digging, you know, there's a real journalist in, you know, instinct there to just find out more about the story. You know, that is, you know, I mean, I think you and I used to talk about this and, you know, how in the world of rock writing, you know, it was, it was primarily like the easiest way to distinguish yourself was the ability to record a story, you know, like to, to not just want to interview the famous person, but right. to be able to do a news story and, you know, you know, get on something. And, um, you know, that certainly was, was very helpful to me. Uh, and, you know, you've taken it like to a, to a, an entirely different level mm -hmm. by just you know, having a feel for, um, you know, there might be something really rich here and then mining that and, and getting inside it and, you know, doing all that, um, uh, you know, we used to call like shoe leather. You know. <laughs> right, right. And that's that's the fun part of the job, really. Uh, it comes in particularly with Andy, I guess, with with books. And, and you must know this, too, Anthony, from your, your excellent Blue Reed book. I mean, it's sometimes you track down people. Uh, as you did early in Lou's life, you know, who haven't spoken to the press much or haven't spoken in decades. And they have all this, they have all this stories and information. Um, you know, like when I was um, 
I guess an example of that, when I was doing uh, my book on the Grateful Dead a few years ago, uh, I made a number of trips to Marin County in, in San Francisco to interview people. And one day I had an interview set up with somebody uh, who canceled. And I was like, oh, okay, uh, what am I going to do? I, I don't want to waste a day, you know, uh, out here. And I realized like, oh, yeah, there was that one guy who I reached out to who worked for them for like two years in the 70s. And he'd be willing to talk to me. Oh, let me see if he's around. So I call him. He's like, yeah, I'm around, you know, <laughs> I'm here. So we get together at this little coffee shop in Mill Valley. And um, he said, he said, yeah, you know, I worked for them like around the time they made blues for Allah. And I said, oh, cool. And he goes, and you know, I was there in Bob Weir's studio when they were making the record. And I said, oh, cool, that's great. And he goes, and you know, I made my own tapes of all those sessions. And I was like, uh, come again. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, he, and, and yeah, he, had, he said, yeah, I'll lend them to you. And he had boxes of cassette tapes. He just sat there and rolled and with his own little tape recorder. So there was like hours of them like talking in the studio. It wasn't just like music. It was like just the like you hear David Crosby. This, that's the motif of our conversation, I guess. David Crosby, David Crosby <laughs> popping in, you know, to visit and jam, and you hear things being lit up, <laughs> and you know. But you also hear various, you know, you just hear the band bantering with each other and talking about, oh, I just got a new dog or, you know, whatever. And it was like this, this goldmine of information that, um, you know, came in real handy for the book. And, and it's just, was one of those somewhat accidental things. And, you know, when that happens, it's like, wow, this is, that's why I'm doing this, you know? Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, cause also, and, and again, I'm sure you've had many experiences, Anthony yourself, it's the main people are, aren't always, don't always have the best stories. Oh, no, that's true. You know, or, or they've told the same story so many times it's on automatic pilot. Uh, so it's it's what's really fun is to track down, you know, people who knew them at various points and 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 bring a different perspective and have and remember things better. So. Yeah, I mean, because that's the thing. Uh, interestingly, those those off-told stories, you know, each time they get revised, they become like. I don't want to say like a little less truthful, but a little less, um, you know, authentic, you know, like just right. kind of, they're a little bit more like what worked the last time I told this story. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, you know, the, the constant process of repetition uh, kind of like smooths the edges of the story until finally, when you talk to somebody else, like who's able to restore all that. You know, yes. Is, yes. Yeah, that's a big time. Yeah, yeah. There, there was one major classic music figure. I won't say who it was. Who was uh, this for for a Rolling Stone article? Who was, you know, just rolling out those stories. And and I, and I said, oh, that's oh, that was really interesting about that song. We told the story about a particular hit that we've all heard. And I said, oh, that's great. You know, but oh, can I ask you a little more? Like, what else do you remember? And he got really testy. Like, that's it. That's the story. Sorry. <laughs> it's like. Okay, um, <laughs> but uh, they're not always like that. But but you know, <laughs> but you know this this brings up also something um, that again, uh, Anthony, you surely must have dealt with with your with your book. Um, and one of the things that draws me maybe to do books that I've been doing lately on CSNY and the Dead, and which is that not only are these historical figures at this point in American culture need to be documented, you know. Um, to, not to use a cliche here, but the, they're not getting any younger and the people okay. around them. And I think it's so important to do primary source research, and which is a fancy word for new interviews with people uh, who, who both, whether the subjects or, and mm -hmm. those people around them, uh, you know, before it's, you know, before it's too late, I don't mean to sound ghoulish about that, but no, I mean, you know, next, next year, next year is, uh, we're going to be seeing Bob Dylan, Simon Garfunkel, David Crosby, again, uh, Joan Baez and others turning 80 because 1941 was a huge year for uh, for baby boom rockers, even though that was before the baby boom. Um, so, you know, it gives you a sense of, boy, how much time has passed and, and it's important to uh, to talk to these people and, and get these stories, even, you know, some of them are off told and, and the people who knew them who are, you know, their generation uh, and get all this down, you know, and I think there's a, there's um, a, a, maybe a bit of urgency about that. At least I feel that, you know, like la la last year, Gordon Lightfoot, 
uh, someone I've never interviewed in my life announced his 80th birthday tour. And I thought, wow, <laughs> he's 80. He's, he turned 80 before those other people. And I'd never interviewed him before. And so I pitched it to Rolling Stone. And, they, and Rolling Stone, by the way, Jason Fine, Christian Hoard, all those folks I work with, incredibly supportive of all these, all these ideas I bring them. They're like, that's a great story, do it. Um, and I really appreciate that support. And with Gordon Lightfoot, it was just like, you know, we, we, we should, he sounds, seems like a really interesting character. And, you know, so I spent a day with Gordon Lightfoot and turned 80. Yeah. And who knows how many more of those interviews he's going to give. Um, and, and it was really interesting. You know, he was, he was there when Dylan went electric at Newport. You know, he was there like uh, not, he didn't, he missed the actual performance, but he was there in the afternoon when like, Albert Grossman and Pete Seeger and all those people were fighting backstage over Dylan going electric and were tussling in the ground. And Gordon Lightfoot was just standing there watching all this. You know, I was like, wow, I'd never heard Gordon Lightfoot's take on, on the day Dylan went electric. And um, so, one of, you know, so I, you know, I just feel like uh, getting some of these characters now is, is, uh, is important. Yeah, it's very funny bringing up Gordon Lightfoot, who I actually like a great deal. Yeah, um, there, great record. <laughs> what was that? He made some great records, and, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, there was a, you know, some product I bought. You know, that was you know kind of, uh, you know, like a modern product by you know a kind of new company, and like they sent me like a little, um, a little quiz, you know, along with you know your purchase and. You know, and like, uh, hey, you know, like, you know, how often do you use this or whatever? And then the last question was, what is your favorite Gordon Lightfoot song? <laughs> <laughs> it was like, clever. <laughs> but um, and you thought Sundown, yeah. Highway. Um, but Sundown, of course, is written about the woman that was with John Belushi when the night he died. And uh, plenty of stories about her, you know, that musicians tell and um yeah, kathy smith that's a great sort of untold story that maybe i'll do that next <laughs> she just recently died actually i believe so yeah um well you know you mentioned your grateful dead book and i wonder you know you could you know that is a whole world in and of itself and uh you know talk a little bit about you know determining to do that and um getting involved in it and what that experience was like uh, sure. Uh, the Dead is another one of those bands. When I was um, a teenager, uh, I discovered them back then in the seventies. It was you know the, you know them, Simon and Garfunkel, the Almond Brothers, the Dead, Joni Mitchell, Stevie Wonder in the seventies. You know there were a bunch of people I, I discovered right away. And and uh, and and in the case of the Dead, um, you know when I decided to do that book, which was almost ten years ago. At that point, um, there had only been one previous biography of them, which is a terrific book by Dennis McNally, which had come out about 10 or 15 years before that. And um, uh, when I started writing for Rolling Stone in 2008, uh, was around the time that the dead first started reuniting, uh, doing a bunch of shows, you know, many years after Jerry Garcia had died. And I remember one of my editors there at the time um, calling me and saying, we need someone to write about the Grateful Dead. Like, do you know anything about them? I'm like, well, yeah, I kind of grew up with that music. So I, I ended up doing a bunch of stories on the dead and interviewing, interviewing those guys in 2008, 2009, and 10, and so forth, uh, when they started further and all those other groups. And it, and it completely um, reinvigorated my uh, interest in them. I mean, I always kind of kept up with their, still played some of their records around the house and stuff, but talking to them for like probably the first time ever in those years reminded me like, wow, this is such an interesting saga in and of itself. And it's continuing after Jerry, which is, you know, no one would have necessarily predicted that. And also, you know, reminded me of the durability of those songs. Most, most of the Jerry Garcia, Robert Hunter songs, you yeah. know, one of the things that's always frustrated me about people who don't like the dead is they'll say, Oh, you know, they're just a bunch of, they were just a bunch of old hippies who were, stoned hippies who noodled around on the instruments. And I would say, well, that's partly true, <laughs> but they also, uh, well, they were great musicians, but they, they wrote incredible songs that have stood the test of time. I mean, those, 
you know, whether it's, you know, uh, you know the Working Man's Dead songs, the Uncle Dan's Band stuff. I mean, that stuff is like Americana at this point. I mean, they were they were rooted in folk songs. And those songs have uh, have endured to this day. They've been covered repeatedly by an incredibly wide range of artists. And so that also drew me back. And I thought, you know, uh, it's been a long time since someone wrote a book on the dead. Uh, I uh, Maybe I can bring something new to it to that story. And, um, and I, I approached them and said, you know, would you, would they be interested in doing interviews? And of course, you know, it would be, uh, I, I would control the book. It wasn't their book, but, and they were, they were amenable to that since I had been hanging around with them and doing these Rolling Stone stories. And uh, so that's kind of how it went. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it was, uh, it was, it was often challenging, a lot of uh, contradictory stories in that from people not remembering things the way someone else might. But, um, but, you know, I just kind of, you know, it was my, my hope to kind of add a little something to that saga, which, you know, I'm, I'm probably not the only person who's still fascinated with that, you know, knowing, judging people who still go to dead and company shows, even not now, but, you know, there's still, there's still that, that fascination with them and all kinds of arcane information. So, oh, I think that there's, you know, I mean, I think Dead and Company has kind of really revived things a lot. Um, you know, I mean, there seems to be like a lot of attention to those shows. I mean, were they were they to happen again? What you know? Do you have any like tales to tell from your days with the Dead? <laughs> I mean, they were probably, you know, much better behaved by that point, but no. <laughs> uh, tales to tell from my days with the Grateful Dead. Um, well, let's see. Uh, I, I had a, a very interesting day uh, in interviewing Mickey Hart at his house, which is in uh, uh, Sebastopol, up in uh, north of, uh, and, that, uh, he, and we, we just like spent the day like, he didn't want to stay. Mickey Hart is the kind of guy who's always like working on something. He's kind of got this hyperactive energy. And it was reflected in the interview because he's got this pretty nice spread. And we would do like 15 minutes in one room. And then he'd be like, All right, let's go somewhere else now. And we go out to the garden and do 15, 20 minutes there. Like, <laughs> OK, now let's go somewhere else. And like, OK, so it was like the whole day following him around his his house and ended with his personal chef uh, making us dinner. I was like, wow. It's, that's personal chef. <laughs> that's that's this 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 gig pays well for these guys. Um, uh, but yeah, I know it was it was um, I was able to get to talk to people who hadn't talked before. Some of the members of their road crew, uh, people who worked, you know, and their 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 sound people and so forth, you know, from back in the day. Uh, you know, uh, Mountain Girl, you know, was very nice. Invited me into her house uh, in Oregon. Uh, to talk about things and and so you know and and actually one of the great things was um, going to the the Grateful Dead archives which are at uh, UC UC Santa Cruz uh, which had kind of just started really and and they gave me access to um, all kinds of you know contracts and paperwork and uh, and and you know the, everything that was in the dead files that was just they just dumped in this this university <laughs> you know so um and it was still being sorted through, but you know, you you just open up a file of like like fan letters from the '70s that they still kept, you know, and with all kinds of doodles on them and things like that. So, um, you know, there were many different uh, uh, ways to gather information from that. That was that uh, you know was was kind of fascinating in and of itself. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, when introducing you, you know, the um uh the book about jeff buckley and his father tim buckley and you know that again you know struck me at the time as such a great idea you know a, a, an idea that you know i think so many great ideas are obvious once somebody <laughs> has them you know like that you know it somehow hadn't occurred to anybody to do but then like when you had it it's just like oh yeah like that's a great idea um you know talk about the genesis of that project and um you know, at, at, at the time, you know, there was so much fascination with Jeff Buckley, but, uh, you know, you really gave it, um, excuse me, a, a historical perspective that, uh, you know, that that story had, had lacked for the most well, part. Thank no, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, that started really with, with me um, seeing Jeff Buckley live at a, a little club called Shanae 
in East Village in the early 90s. And, and uh, I was actually assigned, uh, I was a story I was doing for the New York Times. And one of my editors there said, um, he said, you know, uh, uh, I keep hearing about this guy, Jeff Buckley. He's the son of Tim Buckley. He's singing in some no-name Irish bar in the village. And the whole thing was so surreal. I was like, you know, I knew Tim Buckley was, but I was like, Tim Buckley had a son? I didn't even know that. And he's singing in the East Village. <laughs> it, was like, it was like the most left field thing I ever heard. And, and I had friends I worked with who uh, at Entertainment Weekly Magazine at the time who lived in that area. And they were telling me the same thing. So I ended up doing that story and, and interviewing Jeff. And he was such a... Uh, kind of fascinating character. I mean, he was unlike anything happening in music that I, in 1993, I mean, here was this guy who was a kind of unabashed, earnest, romantic balladeer, but not in a corny way. He had an incredibly diverse repertoire. Repertoire. You could go see him at Chenet and he might do a, a Bad Brain song and then a Nina Simone cover and then one of his own few songs that he had at the time. And, and there was nothing like, I mean, he had a sense of humor and he could be jokey on stage, but he wasn't ironic or anything that, you know, or, or angsty, grungy as, as was happening in, in rock at the time. And so he really kind of just seemed like, you know, uh, to, to, to me and many others, I, I wasn't the first person to say this, to think like, wow, this is someone who's, who has a real depth of knowledge of music and, and seems like he could be in that classic artist vein he could be like a van morrison or an elvis costello or like one of those people who just has this long deep career and so when he died it was i remember getting that email that he was missing in the in the wolf river down in memphis and it was just like just shocking and, and horrible and uh and i right away started thinking i don't know why just like you know i'd never written a book before but i thought boy this what i knew about him and his life like that's an interesting tragic story and I didn't make the, you know, at the time I thought I'll just do a book on Jeff. And then the more I researched it and talked to people, read some of his journals, I realized he knew a lot more about Tim Buckley than he ever let on, you know, that uh, he, um, in his journal entries, he, he you know, because if you, if you ever interviewed Jeff Buckley, he'd be like, well, I didn't know Tim. I only met him once. And it was just true. And he said, I don't really have much to say. And he really wanted to distance himself. There was a lot, there were a lot of hurt feelings, I think, there. Tim left Jeff when Jeff was barely born and so forth. His mother raised him. Uh, but in reading Jeff's journals and talking to people, you realize that he, he, he knew Tim's story in and out. And what was fascinating- How did you, that, uh, how did you get the journals? Oh, um, uh, his mother, Mary Guibert, was, was, uh, let me borrow them. She, she was in, still is in ownership of them. And I approached her about the book and she was like, very supportive of it from the start. So she said, yeah, you know, you can interview me and, and if you want to, you know, read these things. And I said, wow, it was, and it was amazing. And we've actually just published those uh, about a year ago in a book called Jeff Buckley, His Own Voice, uh, which is a collection of, of, of Jeff's own writing and lyrics and things like that. And, uh, you know, what became clear, what was fascinating about Jeff is that he was right away, right, really kind of wary of the music business. From the moment I talked to him, and he had a right to be <laughs> in many ways. But he was, on one hand, being courted by every record company that existed, um, given a really good contract with really unlimited artistic freedom from Sony Music. And yet he was still so uh, uh, cautious and, like I say, wary about it. And, and, and I thought, well, where does this come from? And sure enough, you know, Tim Buckley had a very bumpy career he was a, one of those new Bob Dylan types for a while. Yeah. That everybody thought he was going to do that. But Tim was like, no, I want to do experimental jazz scat singing instead. You know, he went off on all kinds of tangents and you know, his career went up and down. He fought with his, he was dropped by record companies. He, 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 Tim tried to be a real artist and suffered for it ultimately. And, and it really kind of broke his spirit in a lot of ways. And, I, and Jeff knew all that, even though he said he wouldn't, he didn't know it. He knew it, he knew he, everything. And it made him very wary of managers and record company people and all of that stuff. And so I realized like, I gotta tell Tim Buckley's story too, because you need to know that because that informs everything Jeff did, you know? I mean, and, and not in like Jeff was imitating him in any way, but, but th that was something I, I learned a lot along the way. And so I thought, wow, you know, these two stories have to be laid out for you to really understand uh, Jeff as much as we can try to. No, that was um, 
I mean, a brilliant insight. And, uh, you know, it has such a kind of great emotional quality as well, you know, that um, aspect of that sort of unformed connection in a way, you know, between them. Yeah, that, that story, I mean, that's one of those things that just um, no, no great brilliance on my part, but I mean, a father and a son who barely knew each other, both grew up to be musicians and both die, you know, around the same age. You know, I mean, that's just an unbelievable story to tell. I mean, you yeah. can't make that up. <laughs> you know, um, you know I, I've had some people say to me once, you know, you should write a novel about music. And I, I always think, well, I don't know, but there's so many real life stories in what we cover. You don't need to make stuff up. There are um, incredible stories out there. Some of them rarely told, some of them off told, but you know, like you couldn't make that Buckley story up if you wanted, you know, I mean, it's, it's an incredible thing to, uh, to, to try to put out there in the world. Well, we do have a question um, from Husna Hashim. Uh, it says, can you speak to the genesis and writing of your book, Fire and Rain? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, uh, that was a book I wrote about the year 1970, uh, and not only the year in music and, uh, the year in, in the country. And, um, it's funny Genesis story. Well, here's the Genesis story of it. I just published a book on Sonic Youth. This was in 2008. And, um, my, my, my poor wife, Maggie, and my child had to endure two years of me playing <laughs> Sonic Youth records around the house. Uh, not necessarily the music they would gravitate toward. And um, so I, uh, I was in my car once with, with them and, and my wife, Maggie, who's a magazine editor and, and very good at ideas. So, well, you know, what are you gonna do next? And I said, I don't know. And she said, well, you know, you really should write about all that music that you that loved as a kid and you still play around the house. So Simon and Garfunkel, CSN records, James Taylor, you still play those records. Those are clearly very meaningful records to you. You need to write about them. And at that point in my career, I had never written in depth really about any of that stuff. I think it was also because she loved that stuff and wanted to purge Sonic Youth from her <laughs> brain. Um, <laughs> so um, I said, I said, you know, that's an interesting idea. But like, we don't need another Beatles book. What would I write? And she said the magic phrase, which was a magic question, which was, well, is, do they have anything in common like a year? And it just instantly popped into my head. Oh, 1970. Like you think of like Bridge Over Troubled Water, Let It Be, uh, Deja Vu and Sweet Baby James all came out that year. And I thought, well, that's right away. I was like, wow, that's really interesting. You have these, like these three iconic groups from the 60s putting out these iconic records and then breaking up. And then you have this guy, James Taylor, coming out of sort of nowhere to become the emblematic 70s troubadour guy. And I thought, and they all kind of knew each other too at the time, you know, Stephen Stills played on Ringo Starr's that Don't Come Easy and James Taylor knew Art Garfunkel then. I mean, there was all, all these interconnections. Well, so smaller music world. Beatles, yeah. I'm sorry? And had been signed by the Beatles. That's right, right, right. And James Taylor had the Apple Records connection. There were all these connections with these with these folks, and uh, and I thought, wow, like what? A, I guess I've always been. The other thing is I've always been um, sort of fascinated with you know the end of the '60s, beginning of the '70s, and that that switch, you know, from the yeah the hope of the '60s and the, to the to the buzzkill '70s that I grew up in. I mean, I grew up in the '70s, and I have two older sisters. <laughs> who always reminding me of what I missed, you know, <laughs> oh, you missed Woodstock, you missed this, this. And uh, I'd be like, okay, here I am in the seventies. All right. Uh, I'll, uh, what happened? You know? And, and I thought, well, this would be an interesting way to explore that uh, using music as the, as the prism uh, to, to talk about, you know, using these groups breaking up and James Taylor rising up and everything going around them. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was, um, uh, th th I learned a lot from that book as well. <laughs> you know, I hadn't really made that connection until that car ride. And, uh, and so um, uh, it was, it was a real rewarding book to do anyway, to kind of dive into that old music. And that kind of led me to do the CSNY book not long afterwards. Cause I thought I want to keep writing about these guys. They were fascinating in 1970 where they imploded, but there was so much more to that story. 
Um, I got a note here that, in fact, that question was not from the person I mentioned, but from Michael. Ah. I'm terribly sorry. No problem. Uh, Good question. Thank you. Yeah, the um, that moment of transition, I mean, is really, uh, I mean, a, a completely fascinating era. I mean, I think I always, I think about like, um, you know, in terms of the Rolling Stones, uh, you know, kind of a little bit at sea amid the, you know, kind of flower power and all this other stuff of the 60s. And then, you know, once the 70s kind of roll in with, you know, much more sort of, uh, you know, kind of me decade and, you know, that element, like they, you know, made their greatest records, you know, like the, right. the kind of context in which, you know, the, those things happen you know, is always like very revealing, you know, and, and kind of important to explore, you know, and um, yeah, they didn't really kind of get going until, I mean, for me, Be Beggar's Banquet in 68 was the first really, really great record to me, like start to finish, but, but they were almost like late bloomers to me <laughs> compared to some of their peers, you know. Well, they were, you know, I mean, they were, you know, obviously best known as a live band and also, you um, uh and as a band that made singles you know i mean they still they had lots of you know i, I, I mean know. not really hits but like you know like individual songs but yeah they never really made a a kind of consistent uh you know kind of extremely strong you know album until beggar's banquet although you know i mean those early rolling stones records are kind of essential for i don't no, know totally. yeah yeah totally Satanic uh, Majesties. <laughs> no, well, that that speaks to the you know where are we and what are we doing? Yeah. And why yeah. are we here and what's <laughs> happening? And uh, you know, trying to make sense out of that era. I don't think that really kind of played to their strength. <laughs> yeah. you know, I think it got darker. They got stronger. You know. Well, uh, well, I'm gonna throw a question at you, Anthony. We've talked about this a little bit since you teach some of this. You teach these courses yeah. on these classic artists. Uh, what is the interest from, from your students? I mean, if you can generalize that, uh, you're, you're talking, you know, people college age. Um, how, what's their, what's the, obviously they're coming to your classes. So they're obviously interested in learning about the Beatles or Lou Reed or the Stones. Um, how does this speak to them, this music from decades ago? Well, uh, I think there's a variety of answers to that question uh, because I get that all the time. And I, I mostly get it. I mean, you asked it in, in an authentic, you know, intelligent, <laughs> but I, I often get it from people who are like, do they even know who they are? Do they even know who the Beatles are? You know, do they know who the Rolling Stones are? Uh, the answer to all those questions are some of them, you know, uh, there is one of the main effects and often overlooked effects of um, of digital culture is the flattening of chronology. So you could listen to, you know, you could, you know, people are bouncing around and, you know, suddenly they hear a Jimi Hendrix song or David Bowie or, um, you know, someone like that. And those songs can sound and look, I should add, exactly as if they were recorded, you know, like a week ago, you know, there isn't, um, you know, this is assuming you're interested in rock and roll. I mean, obviously if, you know, you're, um, you know, whatever, you know, like with, you know, listening to Beyonce or whatever, you know, that, that pop music thing is a different sort of thing. But if, you know, if rock and roll, you know, resonates for you in any regard, uh, there's plenty of older stuff that still, um, looks contemporary and feels contemporary um a lot of it also they get it from their parents you mm -hmm. know uh students these days uh i mean much to my delight like actually for the most part like their parents and like older people <laughs> you know i remember when i was first invited to uh and, you know to teach at, at penn uh now god nearly 20 years ago in 2002 wow, wow. Um, Congratulations, Anthony. That's well, amazing. Yeah, the um, 
I remember thinking like, do I really want to do this? Cause I mean, I was, it was still that era where anywhere you went, you know, as a representative of Rolling Stone or something like that, you know, you, there was, you know, like some sort of, you know, you were denounced and, you know, why aren't you doing this? And, you know, it was a constant fight. Uh, and I just thought, do I really want to put up with that? And I was like, well, let's try it. But in fact, um, uh, younger people from that era and certainly to this day are extremely open-minded. Uh, and so like, it was just like, oh God, you know, my dad always played the Rolling Stones or my, my dad always played like Bob Dylan or, you know, um, and then, you know, look, you get the occasional kid who comes in who knows everything, you know, just, uh, you know, you know, got bit by the bug and, uh, you know, decided to dive in. And uh, it's entirely fascinating. I mean, this is somewhat related, but, um, you know, we just, uh, in my arts and popular culture class, we just watched uh, Almost Famous. Mm. You know, it's the 20th anniversary of Almost Famous. Right. <clears throat> and so much of the conversation was about consent, you know, in that movie. You know, the, the Penny Lane character, high on um, quaaludes, you know, which she took, you know, in despair over her relationship with the guy from the band, right. you know, is kissed by, you know, the Cameron Crowe character, you know, even though she's incoherent, essentially. Um, you know, the Cameron Crowe character has his, you know, is deflowered by these, you know, kind of groupy girls, right. Right. you know, and it's like, you know, these questions like, well, you know, did he want that? You know, did he, you know, he's saying no, and he's wow. saying, don't do it. And like, and right. there's a whole um, perspective that is new that it was, I mean, these were explorations. I mean, these weren't denunciations, but these were, right, right. you know, we were, we're talking about a movie, you know, that came out in 2000, made about 19, a movie that came out in 2000 that was made about 1973 that we're discussing in 2020. <laughs> and that's just like fascinating stuff to do, you know, like, right. uh, but there was never any kind of like, well, who cares about this? You know, it was just like, oh, that's what this looks like, you know? And um, yeah, that, that reminds me too, uh, one of the go back to you were telling me about, you know, left field stories that I like to do. Uh, I right, right when that movie was turning 20, which was a couple months ago, um, I, you know, there was a real band. The band in that movie is called Stillwater. Yes. There was a real band called Stillwater in the seventies, a Southern rock band. And I, they're still all still around. So I, I, I did a story on the real Stillwater whose story weirdly parallels <laughs> in the band. You know, they, uh, they had some of the same adventures, you know, jumping off of uh, roofs into hotel pools and things like that and never quite making it most people didn't realize there was an actual real band called uh, called Stillwater, and uh, and you know how you know I mean Cameron Crowe. Cameron know that? Kind of blanked on them. I'm sorry. Did Cameron know that? He uh, he vaguely remembered there was such a band, but he didn't he didn't model it after them. It was just a kind of a quintel. They were uh, on Cap. They recorded for Capricorn Records. They were label mates with the Allman Brothers and all those people back then, Elvin Bishop and all that. Uh, they were just like the outlaws. It all comes back to the outlaws, Anthony. Like, like, the, so three, the, three, the three guitar army kind of band, Southern rock. Uh, but, um, you know, and, and they all, you know, they kind of hit a dead end and they're all in different, none of them are really making music anymore full time. And so, uh, you know, one of them works for a carpet repair company and thing, you know, things, they're just like regular folks now, but they had their one little moment. So that was, that was uh, a fun story to, to to track down and you know find out that they only got like you know five thousand dollars to the rights to their name in almost famous which they had to split seven ways since there were seven guys <laughs> like uh, not a big payday for them yeah, right exactly yeah. <laughs> um but th but that's interesting that you guys were discussing that movie uh like that in the class that's fascinating yeah so you know it um you yeah, know we're doing bruce next week uh, next next week, uh, God, 
week. No, in January, we'll be uh, in the spring, I'll be doing a class on Springsteen. And uh, so, you know, there's, there's been a lot of preliminary interest in that. And so we'll, uh, you know, we'll see who turns up and what we end up doing. Yeah, unless, that's great. You know, I mean, one of the things that's so sort of fascinating to, to chronicle, I mean, pop music is such an ever shifting beast. And by when I say pop, I mean, that's an umbrella yeah. term, rock, hip hop, whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, the way that, you know, for decades when rock and roll was the dominant form, you know, pop music was built on vernacular music, you know, folk and blues, country, boogie woogie, that was the foundation. And that's gone now in modern music. You know, it, it, the, the roots of modern music are, are hip hop or beats, electronic music. Uh, the, you know, you, you don't hear blues chord changes on a Kendrick Lamar record. Right. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's just the, the evolution of the music. Um, but it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing to, to observe. You know, a few years ago, I was asked to, if I wanted to do a piece about the making of, of Kendrick Lamar's record, Damn, which I said, yeah, absolutely. I, I really like that record a lot. Like it was different than the one before. And, and um, I, I talked to all the, you know, the producers and collaborators and, and just, you know, uh, letting, you know, talk, hearing about how they put that record together you know, and, and, you know, in typical hip hop way, you start with a beat, maybe add this or that, you experiment, you throw this in there, oh, that's not working, let's throw this. Oh, there's that singer we know, let's see if he wants to add or she wants to add something here. Oh, let's do that. Um, it was totally fascinating and just, you know, kind of rammed that home to me that, that it seems like that one era of, uh, you know, the way that the Great American Songbook before rock, that was built on a completely different uh, foundation of music and that ended and now we, now we're into a whole other era of music. And like I said, it's, it's totally valid, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a real you know, shift. And when you see now so many of these sort of classic rock people you know, passing away is more and more, it's, it's almost like, is that, is, that, is that vernacular foundation gonna go with, die with them? <laughs> it sounds ghoulish, but you know, you know, uh, is it gonna end there? You know? Who knows? Who knows where music's going to go next? I guess is is the uh, upshot of that. But it's a fa it's it's always a fascinating thing to track uh, for me, at least after all these decades. Yeah, completely. Well, what how, do you have a longer you know a book type project going at the moment, or what is your? Uh, don't at the moment mulling over a few things, but uh, Rolling Stone's keeping me uh, happily busy these days. So um, you know. Uh, uh, recently published a big epic story on, on the Doobie Brothers, which I learned a lot. They were just inducted into the Rock and Roll of Fame. But they were kind of a wilder band than we ever thought, if you listen to some of their music. So, um, uh, but also, you know, did a, a, a story with one of my colleagues, Samantha Song, about uh, uh, more timely on the, uh, the devastation of the, of the virus on, on the people behind the scenes in the music business, like road wow. crews, truck drivers, all the wardrobe people, all those people who are completely out of work and might not work again for a year from now. And like how they're all dealing with not just economic issues, but mental health issues. I mean, these are people who've been, you know, doing these jobs since they were college age. Yeah. You know? They just got hooked into that world of being a roadie and you just go from tour to tour and you, you're, you have that lifestyle and it can pay pretty well. And, and it's just gone. And, and they're all like, and so, you know, uh, you know, th that was a lot of work and a lot of research to do that. So I've been doing a lot of things like that, that uh, I've been um, taking up my time. Hopefully there'll be another book uh, in the near future. Well, David, thank you so much for doing this. It's always such a pleasure to, uh, <laughs> to talk to you. I mean, it's funny, you know, our, our conversations, as we were saying, we're always, you know, like 800, like, uh, you know, kind of private personal jokes you know occurred to me as we were speaking but i think we both behaved ourselves and uh <laughs> that they were Off the record we'll tell more of the uh, about yeah, that back stories back. you know no th thanks so much anthony for having me it was it was uh and, and thanks to the school it was um uh, gr great to great yeah great as always to talk to you and and uh you know um i, I hope you know you have a lot of students who want to want to do this you know because i think I think music journalism is important and uh, there are always stories to tell. And there's a real need for people to, to 
as just to allude to something you said earlier to kind of pound the pavement do that you know that reporting thing where you you know um you get well you can't get together with too many people right now but you know get get on the phone or whatever and 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 do that firsthand reporting and and to tell those stories because uh there's always going to be a need for that. There always will be. Uh, there'll always be a need for critics and all that as well. But there's always a need for people who can who have narrative storytelling skills because there are always stories to tell. Fantastic. That's a perfect note to end on. <laughs> Thank you again. Thanks, Thanks so much. Talk to you later. Bye bye.